In the very first chapter of A Song of Ice and Fire, in the very first sequence of Game of Thrones, we see mysterious icy figures called White Walkers, or Others. At first, we know nothing about them. Now, five books and five seasons later, we still know almost nothing. But we do you know, know some things. so let's look at what we've got and try to work out what the Others are, what they want, and what'll happen. The others appear as white shadows in the darkness, tall and gaunt with bright blue eyes. They come when it's cold in the night, or else they bring the cold and darkness when they come. Old Nan calls them dead things, Sam calls them monsters, and Stannis calls them demons made of snow and ice and cold. But when one's killed, we see they're creatures made of blood and flesh and bone. George Martin has said that they're not dead, but a different sort of life. Strange, beautiful, inhuman, elegant, dangerous. In the show, the walkers look more or less like really old men, with wrinkled skin, white beards, black nails, and bad teeth. Either way, the others clearly aren't dead things or demons, but living creatures. They speak in a language of their own. They laugh, they screech in pain. In the show, they show shock and anger. They make things out of ice. So the others are intelligent, with emotion, and maybe culture. They might not be the monsters that they seem. That said, they do a lot of killing. The others wear rippling, shifting armor that can make them near invisible, and wield strange pale swords so sharp they can slice through ringmail as if it were silk. They fight effortlessly, mercilessly, lightning quick, and with a strength in the show to throw men like ragdolls. Their swords are so cold they shatter steel, and their armor protects them from most blades. They seem unstoppable, but they can be killed with obsidian, also called dragon glass. Sam stabs another with an obsidian dagger, and the walker melts away, its fingers smoking where they touch obsidian. It's also hinted that Valyrian steel swords can kill walkers, and we see this in the show. Jon Snow's Valyrian steel sword disintegrates another into icy CGI. Others also apparently don't like fire, which probably means they'd really hate dragons. The others resurrect the dead as whites, basically zombies controlled by the others. Whites are slow, clumsy things with blue eyes and cold black hands, though in the show they're sometimes skeletal and fast. Whites don't speak and seem to have no humanity left, though they seem to keep some memories. The others make whites out of men, women, children, and animals. Walkers ride dead horses, send a bear into battle, and animate a raven. The others use whites to fight for them, and they are very dangerous. Whites seem stronger than living men, able to lift a man in the air by the throat and near rip their head off him. In the show, they tear through timber with their bare hands, they fall off a cliff and keep on running. They don't seem to feel pain. Even losing their head won't stop them, and if a hand is cut off, the hand will keep moving. Unlike the others, whites aren't hurt by obsidian. The only way to stop them is to chop them into bits, or to burn them. Whites are really flammable, bursting into flame from even a little touch of fire. So one white isn't too bad, but at the Fist of the First Men and at Hardhome in the show, they come in a huge swarm, an unstoppable tide of the living dead, all controlled by the icy white walkers. So what do the others want? What are they doing? Well, they've been killing a lot of humans. In book one, they kill some wildlings and some men of the Night's Watch, and they send whites after the Lord Commander and acting First Ranger at Castle Black. In book three, they use whites to kill hundreds of Night's Watchmen at the Fist of the First Men. Then Sam kills a walker, and later whites are sent after Sam and Gilly. In book five, whites attack Bran and company and attack Hardhome. We also learn the others have been attacking wildlings for years, forcing them to flee south and hide behind the wall. So the others are killing humans of many different groups on a large scale, and are building an army of the dead. But that's not all they're doing. The wildling Craster refers to the others as gods, and has a sort of agreement with them. They don't attack him and his wives, and in return, Craster gives them his male children, leaving the newborns in the snow to be collected by the others. In the show, there's a scene where an other takes one of Craster's sons to a kind of an altar in what looks like the far north land of always winter. There, the baby is changed into what looks like an other. One of Craster's wives refers to the others as Craster's sons, so it looks like the others can transform humans into others, and that some people give their children to the others as a religious offering. 
It's probably not just Craster doing this. There are all sorts of strange wildling cultures further to the north, and some of them are rumoured to worship gods of snow and ice. Sacrifice to the others may be a widespread thing. The word others is used as a curse, like a swear word, and the phrase is almost always the others take you. It's not the others kill you, or the others steal your stuff, it is sometimes the others bugger you, but it's almost always the others take you, suggesting that the others have a history of taking humans. We also hear stories of wildlings who would lay with the others to birth half-human children, which sounds like a different thing, but either way, the others clearly don't just want to kill humans, but also want to use them to make more others. Maybe that's the only way the others can reproduce. Maybe this is part of some kind of natural cycle. For now, we don't know. What we do know is that the others are killing people, they're building an army of the dead, and winter is coming. Melisandre says they're marshalling their evil power and will wage a war for life itself, that they'll bring a night that never ends, unless true men can fight them in a great battle called the War for the Dawn. Stannis calls the others the only enemy that matters, Jon calls them the real foe, and says they will come for us. Everyone's expecting war between humanity and the others. Which could make sense, because a War for the Dawn has apparently happened before. We're told legends of the Long Night, a dark winter thousands of years ago that lasted a generation. It's said that in that darkness, the Others came to extinguish all light and warmth. They swept over holdfasts and cities and kingdoms, felled heroes and armies by the score, riding monstrous ice spiders and the horses of the dead, leading hosts of the slain. When the realms of men were almost at an end, Westeros was saved by the last hero, who with the help of the children of the forest, who might have given him obsidian, established the Night's Watch and defeated the others in battle. After this victory, the wall was built to make sure the others could never come back. So that's the story in Westeros. Across the Narrow Sea, the Rhoynar have legends of a darkness, but there's no mention of the others or a battle. In central Essos, the Dothraki and the cultures of Slaver's Bay seem to have no tales of the Long Night. But in the Far East, there are legends very similar to the one of the Last Hero and the Battle for the Dawn. The Yi Tish say that during the Long Night, they were attacked by the Lion of Night and his demons, who were defeated when a hero called Azor Ahai forged a burning sword and led humanity into battle. Now, huge mysterious citadels called the Five Forts stand to keep the demons out, dividing the realms of men from the Grey Waste beyond. Which sounds a lot like the Wall, right? And the demons of the Lion of Night sound a lot like the others. Isn't it super weird that such similar things happened on apparently opposite sides of the world? George Martin has said that his world is round, so if you went far enough east, you must eventually find Westeros. Maybe these two places, the freezing grey waste and the land of always winter, are connected. Maybe the others of Westeros and the demons of Yi Ti are one and the same, based in some place between the Wall and the Five Forts. That would make this area a centre of cold in this world, leaving Valyria, where the Targaryens and apparently dragons come from, a centre of heat. This gives a sense of order to the fire and ice in this world, and might explain why the Long Night affected Westeros and Yi Ti so badly without affecting central Essos apparently at all. This could also be related to the irregular seasons, which George Martin has suggested will eventually be resolved somehow. Anyway, the main legends agree that the long night ended with a battle led by a hero now prophesied to be reborn and save the world once more. Which, you know, could happen. Jon Snow could be reborn with a flaming sword as Azor High. he could unite the Night's Watch, the Wildlings and the North and lead them to war, killing others with obsidian from the Children of the Forest or from Stannis' mines, and Daenerys could fly in with her dragons to burn away the dead, and Tyrion could ride one of the dragons, and Bran could warg one of the other ones, and Rickon could ride in on a unicorn, and all the good guys could come together and kill all the bad guys, and Daenerys and Jon could make out and rule together as queen and king as fire and ice forever and ever, the end. Except things probably won't be that simple. Does it really make sense for this story to end with a war? We've seen so much war already, and most of it achieves nothing but suffering. Look at Rob Stark's campaign, Daenerys' conquests in Slaver's Bay, Stannis' invasion of Blackwater Bay. They're all seemingly just wars waged by seemingly good people, but they all fail their original goals and cause a huge amount of suffering, not just for the nobility, but for the common people. Look at Arya's chapters at Harrenhal, Jaime's chapters in the Riverlands, at Septon Meribold's speech. We're shown over and over that war is terrible and wrong and pointless. 
George Martin himself was a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War, and many of his other books also have a strong anti-war theme. So how can a story filled with terrible, unjust, pointless wars, and with a great war that saves the world? A War for the Dawn would also be too obvious. George Martin has said that part of the thing he always strives for in his books is not to be predictable. And what could be more predictable than the good guys defeating the evil ice monsters in a big epic battle? Martin has specifically criticised the Lord of the Rings style war between good and evil. He says, we don't need any more dark lords, we don't need any more good guys battling bad guys. The wars in my books are much more morally complex. Showrunner David Benioff has said, it's not going to be your classic good versus evil conflict. So the writer of the series and the creators of the show, as well as the series itself, make it clear that this story won't end with a righteous war between good guys and bad guys. Which makes you wonder, maybe that's not what happened last time either. Legends of the Long Night and the Battle for the Dawn are ancient and weren't even written down until thousands of years after they supposedly happened. We're warned over and over not to trust these tales, so while the Long Night did seem to have happened, and the others clearly are real, the War for the Dawn might not have happened the way we're told. After all, it's pretty hard to believe that humanity could have defeated the others, we've seen how dangerous they are. Would a hero with a flaming sword have been enough to win the war? A popular idea in the fan community is that the Long Night ended with some kind of peaceful agreement between humanity and the others. Hints of this can be found at the Night Fort. The Night Fort is the oldest and largest of the castles on the wall, the chief seat of the Night's Watch for thousands of years. Now, it's abandoned and notorious as a haunted and dreadful place. It's a subject of horror stories and strange legends, some of which hint at a connection between the Night's Watch and the others. This brings us to the story of the Night's King. To clear something up real quick, this White Walker in the show is referred to as the Night King by HBO, but it's probably not the same figure as the legendary Night's King, at least not in the books, so keep that in mind. But the story of the Night's King goes that thousands of years ago, the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch loved a woman with skin as white as the moon and eyes like blue stars, which sounds like an other or a white. He gave his seed to her and his soul as well. He proclaimed her a queen and himself her king, he bound his sworn brothers to his will with strange sorceries and ruled for thirteen years until the Starks and the Wildlings joined together to cast him down. It was then found that the Night's King had been making sacrifices to the others, which might mean giving them babies like Craster. The Night's King was doing this at the Night Fort, and the Night Fort just happens to have a super creepy underground hidden magic door called the Black Gate that lets Night's Watchmen through the wall. It's likely that the Night's King was using this sneaky door to make his secret sacrifices, and the thing is, the Black Gate is as old as the wall itself. Why does the greatest and oldest of the Night's Watch's castles, its chief seat for thousands of years, have an inbuilt sneaky hidden door to beyond the wall? Maybe it had always been used for secret sacrifice to the others. There are several other legends connecting this castle to the others, one about a hero with suspiciously blue eyes, another about a thing that came in the night, it definitely seems like some kind of shady shit involving the others was going on at the Night Fort in the early years of the Watch. The HBO Viewer's Guide hints at a secret at the Night Fort, and this secret may soon be uncovered because in Dance, the Night's Watch starts to restore the castle for habitation. Maybe they'll find that the Night's Watch has a history of sacrifice to the others. And you've got to wonder about the wall itself. We're told that it was built to keep the others out after their defeat in the Battle for the Dawn, but why would you build a wall made of ice to stop ice creatures? And how could it have been built? We're told that the first men cut the ice from frozen lakes into huge blocks, dragged them along on sledges, and stacked them up into the wall. Can you imagine how long that would take? The Great Pyramid of Giza took decades to build that way, and the wall is as long as 2,000 Great Pyramids, much taller too. Even with the help of giants, the wall would have taken centuries or millennia to build. Doesn't it make more sense for the others to have built the wall? You know, the ice creatures who we know can make things out of ice? The humans, meanwhile, could have built the 19 castles along the wall, the structures that actually look like they could have been built by humans. Maybe the long night ended not with war, but with cooperation. We know from Craster that peaceful agreement between humans and others is possible, and we have another precedent in The Pact, which was a peaceful agreement between the First Men and the Children of the Forest after their long, horrible war. Under the pact, the children were given the forests and the first man given everything else. Maybe, similarly, the humans and others agreed to give the land north of the wall to the others and the land south of the wall to the humans. 
A bit of sneaky human sacrifice through the Black Gate might have been part of the deal. Of course, if there ever was an agreement between the humans and the others, it seems long forgotten now. Everyone's gearing up for war, but we actually have the perfect hero to make peace possible again. Jon Snow is the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. He's been on or beyond the wall for almost all the series, and it's hinted pretty explicitly that he has some special destiny. He probably has the blood of the Targaryen Dragon Kings as well as the Stark Kings of Winter, he may be the prophesied Azora High, and he's got some definite similarities with Jesus. However you look at it, Jon seems to be the guy who will deal with the others, and the thing is, Jon has a lot of experience in making peace between peoples. He spends almost all of Dance trying to reconcile the Night's Watch and the Wildlings, two groups who hate each other, have been fighting for thousands of years and seem totally foreign to each other. But John works to achieve peace anyway, because he realises it's best for everyone. He tries to understand and sympathise with the wildlings, and similarly he tries to understand the others. He keeps some whites for observation, and gets Sam to research the others in the Castle Black Library. One of Stannis's knights mockingly asks if John would offer the others hospitality at the Wall. Maybe that'll actually end up happening. John is, of course, currently bleeding in the snow with four stab wounds, but he'll probably be resurrected by Melisandre. In the other resurrections we've seen, people change when they come back from the dead. They seem to become less human. So maybe John will too. He'll certainly feel alienated from the Night's Watch who betrayed him, and he might feel somehow closer to the others. His last line in Dance says he never felt the fourth knife, only the cold. Jon Snow is someone special in this story. He's a hero and a bastard in black. He's honourable and he breaks his vows. He's a son of a Stark and probably a Targaryen. There's a duality in him, a meeting of ice and fire, which makes him perfect to make peace between humanity and the others. It won't be easy. There'll be tough choices, compromises, sacrifices, maybe an uncomfortable marriage. But Jon Snow seems the perfect person to do it. So maybe, when Jon is reborn, he won't be a warrior with a burning sword, but a different kind of hero, a greater kind of hero. Someone who'll work not to rule or destroy, but to cooperate and understand. Maybe John will bring peace and balance to the world of ice and fire. We first saw the others in A Game of Thrones 19 years ago, and we still don't really know what they are and what they're about, but we can work some stuff out. The others are living creatures of ice that resurrect the dead. They're dangerous, they're killing people and building an army of whites, but they're also using humans to reproduce, so they're probably not trying to wipe humans out. Some expect a battle between humanity and the others, which has apparently happened before, but it'd make no sense thematically for the story to end with war. An alternative is peace, and there are hints at the night fort and the wall that humans and others somehow got along in the past. Jon Snow might be the perfect person to bring a new peace. That's one possibility, anyway. For more theories and discussion, you might like to check out the A Song of Ice and Fire subreddit and the Westeros to Dog forums. Thanks for watching. This video was made possible by supporters on Patreon, including Xandria Leonard, Staffio the Seventh, Ragdoll Ralph, Rainies the Cat, Soviet Womble, Florian Forster, Gloria Easby, Matt Armstrong, Paul Barry, Theon's favorite toy, and Sir Shire of House LaBeouf. For production updates, early access, and a vote on the next video topic, you can support this channel at patreon.com slash altshiftx. Cheers.